coming up this week off screen. Three Siphons takes us under Milkwood. Michael Pena plays the Vatican tapes. David Thorpe asks, do I sound gay? Hip hop fashion gets us fresh dressed. Nicolas Cage is an outcast. Jafar Panahi takes us for a ride in Taxi Tehran. Francesco Munzi brings us some black souls. And Bond is back in Spectre. All those to come and more off screen. This is. This is off screen. Off screen. Off screen. The latest film news and reviews. This is Offscreen, the on screen radio show. Welcome to Offscreen, I'm Van Connor. My name is Case Allen. I'm Chris Watson. So, what are we going to start with this week? What's our first heavy hitter of the week? Uh, Mr. Reese Iffens in Under Milk Wood. Ah, so Under Milk Wood, which is uh, based on the I thought it was a poem, it's a mm. radio play by Dawn Thomas. I, I will. I need to admit straight up that I am I am hardly an expert in the source material on this one. I know t- t- Tony Earnshaw, so I, I hear about it through him. But other than that, I know nothing of the work of Dylan Thomas or Under Milkwood beyond the original. Well, I say original film, the 1972 uh, Richard Burton film. So what we have now is a 2015 adaptation where it's all been updated for the times. It's still set in the 70s, though, strangely. Uh, they've not updated the, the okay. setting. It's set in a Welsh village in the 70s. It stars the likes of Reese Iffens and Charlotte Church. And <laughs> you, why do you look really bad Charlotte Church? It? Charlotte Church, <laughs> that they... thespian. Yeah. Yeah. She has done a couple of film roles, hasn't she? A few, yeah. She's done a couple. Uh, I didn't know. Well, so what we have now is we have uh, Captain Cat, played by uh, Reese Evans, who narrates the tale for us. And it begins with the dreams of, uh, narrating the dreams of the residents of this small Welsh fishing village, which I believe is called Milkwood, hence the title, and uh, then takes us through a day in their lives. The whole film literally occupies this one day. Here's a clip. Time passes. Come closer now. Now behind the eyes and secrets of the dreamers in the streets rocked to sleep by the sea. Isn't that a terrible thing? Thank God. We must take our pajamas from the drawer, Mark Pajama. No, 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 no! Here's your arsenic, dear. You wouldn't know he was in the house, Mrs. Ogmore ah, I want to gobble him up. I wish you were not so... So like I say, I I cannot for one second pretend to be anything resembling an expert expert on Under Milk Wood. Um, There is an interesting thing going on with this adaptation where there seems to have been, and I've looked into it since, but I went into the film completely blank. It, there seems to be... Oh, Wilson, are you familiar with it? I'm not, actually, you, no. You're not? Are you, guys? I've lived in Wales for six years, but I know nothing. This is what really. I was going to say. You live in Cardiff. Have. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought it was like a, a thing you have to, in order to get out of paying the toll, you just have to recite <laughs> the first few verses. Yeah. yeah, you recite no, some, sad, yeah. Sadly not, unfortunately. Well, this is the problem, because outside of an academic environment, outside of sort of A-level students studying the work of Under Milkwood, <laughs> or outside of Dylan Thomas aficionados, of which I imagine there have to be some, I, I cannot for the life of me see an audience for this film, because it's really, really dense. There's been no effort, from what I can see, to simplify or contextualise the, the information, the, the source material. So what you've got is this very dry, upfront, just recitation, recital, recital of yeah. the work of Dylan Thomas, presented by 21st century actors in a 70s setting. It's part musical, part poem, all art house. You know, and it looks absolutely stunning. Kevin, Al- Kevin Allen, who's who's director of this, made it absolutely beautiful to look at. I mean, there are times when this looks like an oil painting, and then Reese Ifan shows up, and it looks like it's been done with charcoal. <laughs> that's, that's more to do with Reese Ifan's natural complexion than anything else. Um, the cast of all who notice that they're all obviously Welsh, and you can sort of tell because the, the, the source material is a source of national pride, and so it's not hard to understand why it's got on this top shelf Welsh talent, you know, sort of on board but the problem is it seems to be 
It's a, first, it's a contender for the most Welsh movie ever made. I have to give it that, straight up. But if you don't know... Until there's a Tom Jones biopic. Until there's a Tom Jones <laughs> yeah. biopic starring Ben Whishaw. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Admit it, you want to see Ben Whishaw oh, play Tom Jones. That. that would be quite yeah. a good idea. He, yeah. he nearly played uh, Freddie Mercury. Going to yeah, play I, see, yeah, I, I can remember. see that. Yeah. He was going to, after Sasha Baron Cohen. I don't think that film's ever going to get made. It's never going to yeah. get made. Come on, Brian May. Damn you, Brian May. <laughs> Give us the movie we want. Um, that's the thing. The density of the material, I think, is going to be problematic. It is a very, very well-made film. And it, it harkens more to the likes of, for instance, Derek Jarman than anyone else. If you want to go with your British art house filmmakers, someone like Derek Jarman, it, it, it kind of it calls to mind his work. But in terms of its sheer immersion, it's very successful. Outside of that, the density of the material presents a real problem. I would imagine if you are a fan of the story in general, though, you will love it. So shall we, uh, shall we have a look at what's going on in the world of Cine this week? We've yeah, got some, absolutely. We've got some interesting ones. Uh, some doings are transpiring, to use a term mm, that uh, Wilson knows quite well. We, we, we now have, would you believe, a full set of Power Rangers, Wilson. Well, I've seen the news. Have you yeah. seen them? Have you Because they've been unfolding day they by day. Have, yeah. yeah. Have you seen this? They, they put out a tweet seemingly every day in which they unveil a yeah. new cast member. This started with the pink one. It did, yeah. This started with Naomi Scott as the Pink Ranger. Noticeably, they did not give her a, a human name. It's just the Pink, the Pink Ranger. Ranger. Mm. Well, we now have the full list, and uh, they include um, oh, what's his name, C.J. Ryler from uh, Me and Earl. Yes, from yeah. Me and Earl oh, yeah. the Dangle, and he's going to be the Blue Ranger. Blue Ranger yeah. We have uh, Daka 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 Montgomery. I have no idea. He's, he's an unknown. <laughs> so we have Daka Montgomery. We have uh, Ludi Lin. I think it's Ludi Lin. Ludi Lin, who's going to be the Black Ranger. That's a great name. It is, isn't it? Like, it should be a pop star, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to think. What's oh, Becky Gomez is going to be the Yellow Ranger as well. Okay. And this is where it gets really, really interesting. These are going to be, these are going to be the original Power Rangers. Mm. These are going to be the first Power Rangers from the '90s. Yep. They are going to be the likes. I'm trying to remember. I've got them written down because it's been so long. You might remember these from. Uh, let, uh, let's see. But name the original Power Rangers for me. Uh, Billy, Jason, Trini, Kimberly, and come on, Zach. Come on, yes, he Nailed got it. it. Thank you. He Amazing. got it. Nailed it. In one. <laughs> well done, Wilson. So yes, the original Power Rangers. We have cast members. It's all going ahead. Dean Israelite, who brought us Project Almanac, yeah. he's directing. So Lionsgate's Power Rangers will be upon us in about a year. Well, is it January um, next year? It's, no, it's the one after. It's, it's the just, one after. 2017. Yeah. Okay. Right. Two, that's right, January 2017, yeah. isn't it? That's going to be interesting. You can get yeah. through Christmas and then have some Power Rangers. Look forward to it, yeah. But, yeah, uh, we'll see how that one goes. It's slightly concerning the all unknowns because it suggests it's going to be quite low budget. Oh, I don't know. I mean, maybe that maybe you we'll think about it, maybe that happens. actor budget's gone into you know production value and special yeah, effects. I would hope so. Although, yes. let's be honest, though, you only need a big name to play Zordon and Alpha Five. Maybe Rita Repulsa. Well, I, I'm still haunted by Dragon Ball Evolution, and I'm still really worried it's going to go that way. <laughs> Wilson and I have never quite gotten over that screening of Dragon Ball Evolution, have no, we, Willie? Never. <laughs> but uh, no, come on, I, I'm starting. I'm starting the ball rolling here. Patrick Stewart for Zordon. Make it happen, people. Come on. Make it so. <laughs> exactly. yes. Rangers, there is a problem. <laughs> that would be amazing. So, what are we going to review next? Uh, fresh dressed. Fresh dressed. Okay, so uh, this is one that I don't think really applies to, is really going to uh, affect the lives of anyone in this room. Uh, this is about the link between hip hop and fashion. I don't know. I, think... so, I don't yeah, know. I mean, no, really. none of us are particularly hip hop styled or fashionable, so. I know, I've got a Tribe Called Quest LP for my birthday. Did you? I did actually. Oh, yeah. Aren't you fly? <laughs> I would see straight out of Compton. Well, I'm you're sorry. dope. See, yeah, he's fly, you're, you're dope. dope. Yeah. Um, I don't um, watch dope. I don't as well as I, you watch dope. I watch dope. I never actually got to see dope. It's okay. So, uh, <laughs> Fresh Dress, which is a documentary say, about the link between hip hop and fashion, and takes us from the early days of you know the old Soul Train like break dancing programs yeah. on the MTV, as it was back then, <laughs> on the MTV with the young people and the music videos. The music videos. Yes, they never used to play music videos on MTV. That never happened. That never happened. No, no it's always been the Osbournes. That's where it was. It's just it, was, it started out. In, in like 2001 with the Osborne and that's what it's been ever since yep. uh, but no this takes us from the breakdancing uh, series
those days and uh, the, the fashion that sort of the, the, the dancers used to wear on those kind of shows and takes us all the way through to the present day. Along the way we see the rise of certain trends like Run DMC and the fashions they laid out. We see the first hip-hop moguls branching out into fashion. We see the formation, for instance, of Sean John. We see Eminem's failed attempts to start a fashion brand. <laughs> we see the early modelling days of the likes of Jaimon Hunsu and Channing Tatum, which are so funny to witness now. And uh, we even, just for good measure, stop in and check in on Kid and Play along the way as well. Do you remember Kid and Play? They were real. They weren't just stories your parents told you. They were real, Wilson. Here's a clip. <laughs> By the time we hit the 2000s, it was kind of like, wow, you know, you got to watch the trends because of all the traffic and all of the um, activity that was happening online. Before, what our influences were, were confined to our, what was at our reach. And now with the expansion and the power of the internet, I have access to every fashion, look, brand across the world. So I can be whoever I want to be. We're in a space where they're exchanging so many ideas that I think that um, we're getting back into individual looks. Okay, so like I say, none of us particularly, I don't think, are lifestyle-wise. We don't really invest in the whole hip-hop culture, I don't think, particularly, do we? Not really. Not really. No, yeah. Not really. I mean, we yeah. like a bit of hip-hop. We uh, A bit of the old-school stuff, yeah. We all wear jeans, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's about as far as our, uh, our uh, hip-hop fashionability yeah. I don't takes. wear, like, the MC Hammer pants from the 90s. Funnily enough, right, they do skip over, I think because MC Hammer is, is more associated with, for instance, pop music. Mm-hmm. This is something I did notice, that MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice don't get a lock in. I wonder why. <laughs> no, maybe but it's completely understandable. Because I don't think they were really real world trends. I think they were really? iconic characters, but I don't think they were real world trends. Mm. So that doesn't really happen. I do want to point out, by the way, it is about 50 minutes before they do get to the Fresh Prince. <laughs> they, they do get to the Fresh Prince <laughs> after 50 minutes. Damn and because shit. the Fresh Prince was more integral to hip-hop fashion than any of us actually realise. Because he was used to plug mainstream hip-hop fashion culture. He was actually used to plug the... It was called Cross Colours. It was a brand. It was one of the first yeah. brands specifically designed. And what they would do is they would come up with... And I didn't know this a week ago, but I do now. Where they, the the Cross Colours brand would take a size 36 uh, trousers, for instance, but give them a size 32 waist. And you think, that's kind of... Gone. And they product placed it with the Fresh Prince. And you think, okay, that's kind of... And then they start getting then. inundated with the request from Jamie Foxx and In Living Colour. Nice. Um, and so incidentally, you do get to see a little snippet of uh, Jim Carrey in the background of In Living Colour. It <laughs> never gets acknowledged. You'll be like, that's Jim Carrey. <laughs> but, uh, so as I say, um, right, so there are two sides to this. What you have is... First of all, you have this film, which is a really, really quirky tone. It has this look. We're, we're not. We're not making a documentary about the Holocaust. We're making a documentary about the size of people's pants in the nineties. So this isn't going to be that serious. And you think, okay, fair enough. I'm on board with that. There are serious aspects to it. For instance, uh, they have to off-handedly or at least briefly touch on uh, crime that erupted around the culture. For instance kids being assaulted for items of clothing like uh, coats and sneakers and things like that but at the same time you have that re- that sort of irreverent comedically tinged tone all the way through i should mention this this kicks off with kanye west a talking head of kanye west which it kind of sets the precedent of you know where this is going to end up mm. um and it takes us it's it's a well documented evolution of the fashion I mean, I know infinitely more about hip-hop fashion now than I did a week ago. I didn't know about the whole cross colours thing, for instance. And I know I now know more figures involved in hip-hop fashion than I did before. I've, in the end, it succeeds in educating you on this admittedly quite niche little topic. But on the other end, it does seem to gloss over a few little things. If you're looking at the sociological evolution of hip-hop fashion, for instance, and I'm sure all of us would find this one odd... Why does it not even briefly touch on white America embracing it in particularly in the nineties? Yeah, it's a strange one. Yeah. Yeah, you you I mean, because you it really did all catch know. up like that. Yeah. 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 You know exactly, exactly. What, you can get that image in your head of, of that, yeah. Eminem does turn up, for instance, very, very briefly, but you think, well, why didn't you give us an insight into what brought Eminem around? Because mm. this is how it happened. Specifically about ninety four, ninety five when you started getting that, that culture. Yeah. But uh, you look like you have something to add to that case. 
Not, well, yeah, kind of, a little bit. Go on. Um, when I was at college, I I did, like, an end-of-year thing about uh, 90s America, mm. and it was primarily about the Seattle grunge scene. Yes. But a lot of that was about how the grunge kind of styles and flannel shirts and stuff kind of permeated their culture. Mm. And I did touch on this a little bit. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so it just kind of reminded me of that a little bit. And uh, I was just I was thinking it'd be interesting to see more kind of documentaries about how, like, certain genres of music have taken on fashion and things like that. Yeah, I think maybe if he had to bring up White America's involvement, they'd have to bring up New Metal, which, well, I wouldn't mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say, ultimately, it is a film of... Uh, I think it's, it's filled with those oh-I-remember-when moments. You know, as an audience like member. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, it is nostalgia-driven. It, it, it's peppered throughout with some really fun little animation uh, by Hector. And I don't mean Hector, I mean Hector with an A-H. Hector. Hector. Yeah. <laughs> Hector's animation, which I think really helps the sort of quirky, irreverent tone. And it adds that. It's graffiti-inspired animation. Cool. And yeah, it kind of works. Mm. Um, so some of the... There's, there's characters in there. Uh, Dapper Dan, for instance, is a character that you'll you'll take away from this movie. You'll love seeing Kid and Play again, because it's just amusing to know that Kid and Play are still around and middle-aged, which I don't think anyone... Mm quite expected um in the end you will enjoy the soundtrack you will enjoy the nostalgia of it but if it's not something if it's not a culture that particularly appeals to you anyway it's not really something you're going to enjoy as a film either i feel it does succeed on the terms of sheer nostalgia and enjoyment however but i understand that that is a personal thing for myself rather than anything else i don't think i could show this to my grandmother for instance and she'd enjoy it but uh, yeah you never know your grandmother might be, might be fly she might be fly, yeah. But I do think the film is dope. I'm just going to say that. We're <laughs> so, so white. We're so yeah. white. We can't, well, we can't pull that off. I'm more <laughs> mocha than anything else. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you two are white. He's basically Welsh, and you're from Grimsby. <laughs> yeah, man, my my granddad was actually from Jamaica, even though. So your mother's mother's mother was black. Yeah, you one of those guys. I'm one of those guys, <laughs> even though I am. Yeah, I've just got like Seth Cohen crossed with like. You Seth show me Rogan. a picture. Show me a picture yeah. of this Nubian prince, Kate. Okay? I will. <laughs> <laughs> to quote, uh, is it uh, Bracken Mayer in Go? Oh no, it's, it's Bracken Mayer in Go. Somebody in in the movie Ghost says, "I want to see yeah. a picture of this Nubian princess." Nubian prince. <laughs> So um, we've got some some bad film news we, we've got to report, oh, yeah. which is the Neil Blomkamp uh, story. Oh, I'm not happy about You're this. You're not happy about not this. Not at all. Uh, Neil Blomkamp's Alien 5, his Alien uh, sequel, which, as it was, yeah. has been shelved indefinitely pending the success of, effectively, Prometheus 2. Yeah, but no one wants to see Prometheus 2. Exactly. Yeah. So what Fox are effectively saying now is, hey, fans, if you want the good Alien movie... You have to go and pay your money and give us the money for the bad one first. The one nobody's interested in. So go and pay yeah. your money to Ridley Scott and then we'll give some money to Neil Blomkamp. So. Do you think that the success of The Martian has kind of contributed to, like, to this? They've tried to fast track Aliens uh, Paradise Lost. I wonder, to be honest. Mm. Um, I mean, did you get to see The Martian? Neil? I did, yeah. Oh, we'll talk about it. Right, top so, ten, yeah. I'm looking forward to that, Wilson. <laughs> so on to the Vatican tapes then. Yeah. So good. okay. So from the makers of uh, the Exorcism of Emily Rose comes the Exorcism of some other girl, <laughs> just some, random some, girl. Uh, some yeah. other girl, some random girl, uh, who's who interestingly enough is played by. Do you remember last week when we did Paranormal Inactivity, the the Ghost 3D? Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Do you remember me saying that there was a, a completely superfluous blonde who just happened to hang out of the house and she's like a main character? Is she like the lead in this? She's the lead in so this. It's the, the exorcism of the completely superfluous. Yeah, blonde it's, chick. it's the exorcism of the superfluous chick from uh, <laughs> Paranormal, Paranormal Inactivity. Inactivity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so she's a young girl who's possessed. Michael Pena is a priest. Uh, he comes across the case of you know this mentally ill girl, uh, discovers she's possessed, ha- you know wants to exercise the demon, as it were, and must convince her dad, her boyfriend, and the church to go along with it. However, what is the nature of the spirit that lies within her? Here's a clip. Do you want to tell me why you did this? Somebody! Oh my ah. god. Whoa. 
Code trauma. Code trauma. I need someone to call code You know how whenever an actor uh, reaches a certain certain point on their trail upwards to you know to yeah, becoming yeah. great like Michael Peña like yeah. Michael Peña is currently now how twice this year you and I have both come out of different movies and said hey Michael Peña was the best thing in that movie Michael Peña was really good yeah. in that do you remember this wasn't have you experienced this where you come out of things like Ant-Man and you go wow Michael, Michael Peña's Peña. awesome yeah, yeah. and you come yeah, out of the marsh and you go like Michael, Michael Peña yeah. 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 yeah Michael Peña <laughs> yeah who doesn't love Michael Peña um, you won't be saying that after this film because this is that one that they all have when they're on a certain a, a certain career ascent yeah. that some distributor has put on a shelf and thinks <laughs> ooh ooh they're getting popular put it out now yeah mm. you know like uh, like Jennifer Lawrence and that, what Serena was it? Yeah. Serena yeah oh, no, I was thinking of something else I was thinking of what was that horror film she did oh ooh, if, uh, the house on the left yeah yeah, yeah. house 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 on yeah, the left yeah, yeah, house, yeah, house, house on the left yeah like she had like the first Hunger Games come out and then this yeah. came out of the and then we'll just put this old crap out because yeah. we've got that Hunger Games chick in it yeah she's popular now. This is this feels like that for mm. Michael Pena, <laughs> and uh, I mean it is just lackluster, uninvolving, disposable, thunderingly dull. It's one of those horror films that they just they they cannot decide which horror film they're ripping off first mm. of all. And believe me, you can spot at least half a dozen in there. There's bits all the cliches, all the cliches. It's all in there. It is the dullest variation you've seen this year so far on the Exorcist theme. It uh, borrows liber quite liberally from, from the likes of Stigmata as well, which I found really odd. Um, which is kind of funny because uh, when uh, Paranormal Blondie is in her uh, dowdier phases, she yeah. does look strangely like uh, Patricia Arquette. She does. Um, but the thing is, Stigmata had style. This doesn't. This is Stigmata without style. This is The Exorcist without excitement. And it is, it is cinema without sin, unless boring your audience to tears counts as a sin. It is just crashingly dull. And it's so paint by numbers that until the final minute of the film, when they then come up with a new concept, which is infinitely more enjoyable than the 89 minutes that come, came before it, because it's exactly 90 minutes as well. It's almost, it feels almost contractual. Yeah, like it has to be at least 90 minutes. It really does. You have to get there. And then you've got, you've got this weird cast. You've got Michael Peña, who mm. you're just looking at and thinking, who's got incriminating pictures of you, Michael? Who's who's doing? Who's got pictures of you and that goat, Michael? You know who is it? You then got as the dad, Doug Ray Scott. No, way. yeah, Doug Ray Scott, who seems to be on continuing his quest oh. to make us all regret that he never got that Wolverine. Say the man that was going to Wolverine. Yeah, the man that was going to be Wolverine but lost out to a scheduling conflict. He's been <laughs> making us pay ever since, and this is the latest phase of that. You've got John Patrick Amadori, who is the most disposable boyfriend figure you've ever seen in the I movie. I don't know who he is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, keep it that way. Olivia Dudley, say, plays the central girl. Okay. She's turned up ten, turned up last week in Paranormal and Activity, and you know, which was only marginally less awful than this film, and her character only marginally less, <laughs> only marginally <laughs> more developed than this. And he then got Jaimon Honsu, who turns up in this weird cameo in the first Whoa. minute, and then. They recycled the same cameo mm. midway through the film. The f it's just a so Fast and Furious Seven. Kind of like yeah. that, yeah. It is, but it's one of those movies that's so just agonizingly bad, so such a, a non-event to sit through mm. that by the end of it, you're claw just clawing at yourself, tearing your hair out in frustration, wondering how the hell this got a theatrical release. There are better director video horror films that have never seen theatrical releases than this. Mm. This is. God awful! It is plodding. It is pointless. It's badly shot. I, mean, I say badly shot. It, it, it's one of those. It's trying for that horror movie style. It's trying for that. You know, we're a goth music video style, <laughs> but it's failing miserably. You know how I keep saying, "Oh, they're, they're switching on the Ramstein filter." Yeah. No, they're not in not this one. This isn't the Ramstein filter. Doesn't this like is, a video for uh, him. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just not, is it? No. <laughs> This is more like uh, you remember when uh, Limp Biscuit tried to do a, uh, a heavy metal version of uh, no, know, actually, yeah. tell I know it was actually oh. Vanilla Ice when Vanilla Ice tried to do a heavy metal version. He did a heavy remix of his own. He did a heavy metal version of Ice Ice Baby. It was awful and it looked terrible, and that's what this film reminds me of. And then it gets to the over stylized end credits. And yeah. I want to preface this by saying as well that shortly before we went into this screening, we were all given the the, the sad news about Philip uh, Philip French. Yeah, for the French died this week, mm. and uh, the nine of us critics who were in this room, 
elected as a mark of respect to sit through the entire end credits because Philip French was a stickler for that. Mm. So we sat through the entire credit sequence of the Vatican Tapes for the memory of Philip French. I can't help but feel he deserved better. Just saying. <laughs> but rest in peace, Philip. You will be sorely missed. Uh, the Vatican Tapes, however, will never be missed by anyone. Avoid it. Your life will be better for it. So... What have we got next? We can do. Uh, We've got the box office top ten. The We've box office top ten. Let's well, this it. is always your favourite part of the week. It so. Certainly is. How are we going to do this? Odds and evens. Um, yep. Okay. Yeah, I will let you uh, kick things off. I'll okay. Evil, so then. number ten, the lobster, which I've not seen yet. You've not seen either. No, I've not. I've still not seen it. It sounds really good though, but it's yeah. been released nowhere. Number nine, Legend. Legend. And you saw this one, didn't you? I've still not did, seen it. Did you see Legend? I did indeed. Actually. Did you? What did you think yeah. of it? I'm yeah. curious about this one. I was enjoying it to begin with, but I think it's a standard biopic problem in that it just goes on for far too long because it's about two hours ten when it doesn't need to be. Is it? Yeah, oh, it is. Yeah, I, it is actually. Yeah, and there's all uh, and like with these uh, films, there's always bits in it that comp- completely unnecessary. And in this case, it's actually the narrator of the film. The, the... <laughs> the narrator? Yes, exactly. Is, he says this every single week. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Landon in the 60s, everybody <laughs> yeah. knew to cry. And you're not talking like that in the film. Why are you doing well, it in the narration? And she actually serves no purpose in the film. No, no, I agree. No, she, in reality, she's, she's, she's just a bit on the side. Number eight. Crimson Peak. Now I know you saw this, because we, we were actually texting before you went in. Didn't we? Yes. I have seen this now. Have you well. now seen this I as well? I saw it okay. last Sunday. Okay, Casey, you go first, because we'll also talk about the last one. Go on. Um, yeah, I, I did really like it. I thought it was fun. It was it was a great piece of, like uh, gothic horror, romance. Um, I don't want to spoil anything, but I love Tom Hiddleston's bit at the end. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah I enjoyed it. Willie? It, going into this, for some reason, I thought there'd be like a vampire element to it. But <laughs> Is it because Crimson? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and like with all the blood on the poster, you know, yeah. going down, and you know, with a cast involved, because obviously, you know, Tommy Hilton was in No Me Lovers Left Alive. Yeah, it's and, true. And uh, Mia, oh, Mia, Mia, Mia Wazikowska. Yeah, obviously she was yeah. in Stoker. Uh, so, oh, yeah, so this is uh, which had nothing expected. to do with vampires, despite the title. No, I know. It was well, actually on film four last night. It was, yeah. yeah. Uh, but in the end, it was like Wuthering Heights, but a lot gorier. It was. I thought it was a great throwback to uh, the old Universal horror movies and Hammer at the same time. But I don't think it did for that genre what Pacific Rim did for Toho. Um, having said that, I I went into I went we did the press show and I went into that with the and there seemed to be a collective atmosphere of we're going to enjoy we're going to laugh along with the knowingness of it and it's things like when you are told very early on in the film that. Uh, Oh, the red clay bleeds through the floor. And you're like, of course the house yeah. bleeds. Why wouldn't the house bleed? That's amazing. And here's his gift, this rather sharp pen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I love stuff it's, like that. It might come in handy. It's quite <laughs> knowing about that stuff. But oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think it plays that hand very well. It doesn't go too knowing, it, mm. but it goes just knowing enough. I did enjoy it. I did have fun with it. I think its downfall is that it is quite predictable. It's not quite as grand a film as I want for from Guillermo del Toro, but mm. his visuals are there. And that shot of Tom Hiddleston stood before a pair of double open doors with the snow breezing in yeah. might be my favourite shot of any film this year. Number seven. Sicario, which I still haven't seen. I know that you've seen it also. Wilson has, though. Yeah. I really enjoyed it, and afterwards, weeped for humanity a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you weeped for humanity? Yeah, it, what, it, 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 it's, it's such a... Well, I say a downbeat film. It's a really well-made film. One of the best films I've seen this year, it's actually. It's quite nihilistic, isn't it? It is, yeah. There's, they don't try and sugarcoat what's going on. And Do you remember when Michael Mann made the Miami Vice movie? I use this example yes. a lot. And yes, rather, than, rather than give it any quirk, or th- he just did a straight matter-of-fact. Yeah. yeah. This is very much that sort of style, okay. I think. Yeah. It's procedural, it's bleak, it's harsh. And you just know this sort of thing happens in the real world. Yeah, and I you think, oh, humanity. <laughs> <laughs> but it is really well made. Denis Villeneuve yes. and the cinematography by Roger Deakins. Yeah. Really, really great visuals. And, you know, Roger Deakins deserves a nomination that he won't win at the Academy Awards for. Yet again. Yes, yeah. again. For the 16th yeah. time. Yeah, he yeah. really does. Can we please get Roger Deakins an award at some point, people? Yeah, for God's sake. He deserves it for this one. Give it for this one. Love of God. Number six. Pan. Pan. <laughs> Let's pan it. <laughs> Nibsy. Nibsy. <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't know only, this, Wilson. It's the only fun part about that. It film. is. <laughs> Saying that out loud, Nibsy, <laughs> is the only fun part. Saying Nibsy and Kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kid. Come on, kid. Uh, this is just absolutely god awful. This is a train wreck of a film. Yeah. Well, sorry, a shipwreck of a, a ship, film, actually, yeah. in this case. Very it's a shipwreck of a film. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what anybody involved thinks they were making. I think everyone does also seem. Everyone's performance seems to be aimed at an entirely different film as well. Oh, yeah. Like, I think Hugh Jackman, for instance, I think he thinks that he is the ca- the cartoony, colourful character. He's like doing Panto. I think he? he. But he thinks he's that character. Mm. He's the he's the strong one. And everyone else is the straight man. And then you've got the kid obviously he thinks he's Peter Pan, which, logically enough. Then you've got uh, Garrett Hedlund, who thinks he's the interesting, funny character. They, about it, they all think they're the Jack Sparrow. For lack okay, of a better term, yeah. they think they are the, the Jack Sparrow Jack. element. And everybody does. And you think, by the end of it, what you've got is a film full of Jack Sparrow elements. And you think, no, because the pirate sequels weren't any good, and this isn't either. This is basically what you would get if... And this is to quote, to quote uh, Calvin. Calvin's quote exactly. This is what you would get if you gave Baz Luhrmann some cheese, sent him to sleep, and then asked him to make a uh, pirate sequel. That's exactly what this oh, is. I can't wait to see a Baz Luhrmann pirate film. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see. A... I, I think it would be absolutely atrocious, but just Baz Luhrmann Marvel movie. That's what I want to see. Oh man, Baz Luhrmann's Howard the Duck. <laughs> oh God. Number five. The Last Witch Hunter. Your man Ven. My man, Vin. Yeah. Uh, well, Wilson and I watched Constantine earlier, so Wilson's seen uh, Last Witch Hunter. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Like an Apparently. infinitely, infinitely uh, superior version. Um, basically, it does feel like sort of an oversaturated TV pilot. Uh, yeah. Vin Diesel has no movie star presence outside of the Fast and the Furious franchise, which I think this movie proves. Um Michael Caine and Elijah Wood should know better. They don't. <laughs> Rose Leslie makes her a rather thankless female lead. It's one of those films that you watch and you think, this is thunderingly stupid, but I'm basically enjoying it. And it, if I was going to equate it to anything, it was it would be like that, that Dwayne Johnson Hercules movie. It just just oh, mind-numbingly Brett, stupid. Brett yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mind-numbingly oh stupid. But you know what? I'm basically enjoying it, so eh, why not? Number four. Suffragette. Suffragette. Well... I like Suffrage, yeah, uh, more than most people, it would seem. And uh, I think uh, Meryl Streep's cameo is terrific and perfectly gauging it. I don't think she should be on the poster, though. Uh, hell of a but, but of course more. she would be on the poster, because... Otherwise, Oscar. how's she going to get her Oscar? Exactly. <laughs> how will the cameo voters know? Yeah, but about to say, since Vicky and the Flash did nothing, that's what she'll get the mandatory nomination for. Exactly. Yeah, you keep wondering, yeah. don't you? Yeah, I've not seen the film yet, but you can tell from the trailer, like, Nomination. Yeah, you can, yeah. And it, it is a cameo that does have gravitas, I'll give it that. Um, Kerry Mulligan's performance, though, is excellent in it, but it is. It's a Kerry Mulligan performance. You, these things come in a perforated pack now. Yeah, she can do it in her sleep. You, I'm pretty sure you could buy multi packs of Kerry Mulligan's performance. <laughs> yeah. A multi pack of, of Mulligan's. Yeah, yeah. multi pack of Mulligan's yeah. and just tear one off. A Mulligan of Mulligan's. Yeah. <laughs> Just tear well, one off as not. needed, and yeah. it's exactly the same performance. Mm. It's very good, don't get me wrong, but you kind of know going in. You exactly saw it in an education, it's, yeah. The strength of Suffragette is in the writing, which is very, very well done. Uh, it is in the cinematography, by the name of the cinematographer, I forget, but he did Buried as well. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, this yeah, is the Labyrinthine, that's our weekly reference to Buried. Yeah. The Labyrinthine... Uh, <laughs> we have to have like, like, at least one. Mandatory. Week. mandatory. Exactly, mandatory. And uh, But no, I really liked it. I think, I think it was a very effective and interesting story overall. Number three. Ugh. Paranormal activity, the ghost dimension in three. Do you want to talk about it? Can we just say it's not as bad as the last one, but it's still pretty god awful? I want to give it its one credit, sorry, two credits. Okay. One. You know what? It does really good 3D. 3D is actually really interesting. It does a really good 3D effect with the, with the actual ghost dimension. Mm. But the more important credit is you know what? It's over. The Paranormal <laughs> Activity series is over. Hooray! Hooray, we made it, Willie! Until it gets rebooted in two Until years. Until it gets rebooted in two oh. years. Number two. Number two is The Martian. Which I loved. Did you love? I did, actually. And it's quite surprising because I absolutely hate the book. <laughs> really? I did. It? Yeah. That's a first. You love The Martian. Have you read the book? I've not read the book. I've not I've, read the I've book. I've been wanting to start it. I've, I've got it on the iPad and the yeah. phone. As I, I will. I will read it at some point. And I've seen the first page, and I love it. But <laughs> the words that are written on the front page might be... Yeah, about, say, a stick a calculator on a potato and that's for book. Oh, okay, then I can, yeah. I can go with that. Spuds in space. I like my sci-fi dry, though. But you'll never look at a potato the same way no. after The Martian, to be fair. It is a very fun... Uh, it's the anti-gravity, I keep calling it. 
Mm. It is the anti-gravity. Not that gravity wasn't outstanding. Gravity was outstanding. As is the Martian, but two polar opposite towns. Yeah. Mm. Uh, gravity was very somber, very end is nigh. Martian is very, hey, you know what? I'm going to keep going through this because I've got a positive mental attitude yeah. and some disco music. Number one. And the Drac Pack remains at the top spot. Uh, Hotel Transylvania 2. Have you? Did you get the chance? Did you get the pleasure yet? Uh, we are actually going tomorrow. You're actually going tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. I did see it. Did you see it, Wilson? Uh, yeah. What did you think? I know it's unfair to take a pop-out kids film, but I absolutely hated it. Really? Yeah. I'm surprised at you, actually. No? Did Wait. you like the first one? Not really, though. Okay, that's fair. Uh, would, you say, would you say it's consistent with the first one, though? No, because I think the second one, it, it just... It's a bit like Take Two, I think, in that it just got overly reliant on all the cutaway <laughs> gags, and it doesn't know how to tell a joke properly. Yeah, okay, fair enough. I did not take that that, that position. I well, enjoyed it very much. But... Uh, well, to so say that, you know... I've, did just you know... like your opinion, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's just like <laughs> your, your opinion, opinion man. <laughs> So, did you notice how every single scene we had to rely on a giant green blob that wasn't even the blob to uh, to get some laughs? Yeah, I'll give you that. It was very reliant on that. I did like uh, Tartakovsky's, you know, leaping, you know, uh, scary face animation uh, gag that he kept doing. The sudden roar, the sudden roar effect that he would rely on. That joke, I thought, never quite got old. But I liked the inversion of the overprotective parent formula from the first movie. Uh, I do think Adam Sandler has basic comedic chops in the movie. But since his comedic chops have been somewhat chopped off for a long time, that's really not saying an awful lot. (laughs) Put it this way, it is the best movie I have ever seen star Adam Sandler, Kevin James and David Spade. Should we just say that? It it, it is... (laughs) <laughs> no, I, I think it, I think it is the best movie to have all three of those in the same uh, same space. It's the Citizen Kane of. Well, I can't even finish the last word. <laughs> it is the Citizen Kane of awfulness. Yeah, that'll do. I'd go a bit stronger with that. So, what should we move on to then? What's what's our review then? We got Taxi Tehran. Taxi Tehran. Oh well, this stars uh, Case's favourite filmmaker, Jafar Panahi. I love his work. I, I know and, you do. Jafar Panahi. Jafar Panahi. Jafar Panahi. Yeah. Case. I just keep repeating his name. When we did the intro for this show, Case was meant to do the Jafar <laughs> Panahi bit, and he couldn't do it. So, I think next week you are going to have to. You have to say his name. I'm going to make you say that sentence okay. next week in, I'll in be, the intro. I'll be practicing. Jafar Pahani, yeah. Jafar Pahani. Hey, you want me to say uh, Jimon Honsu? Uh, you want me to say Kevon Jenny Wallace? I will say those names. No, Jafar Panahi, if you don't know, he is the filmmaker who was detained by the Iranian government and then given a ban on making films. He's not allowed to make films <laughs> under order of the Iranian government. Now, he's made two films since. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth mentioning. It's like a Roman Polanski kind of thing. Yeah, this is his third film since being banned from making films. And uh, this plays heavily into his work. So, for instance, the film doesn't have opening or closing credits because the Iranian government wouldn't allow it. And he pleaded with them to let him you know, properly distribute the movie to actually show it. And they just wouldn't go ahead with it. The general gist, what you've got here, this is a found footage film. Filmed from a dash cam in a Tehran-based taxi, driven by uh, Jafar Panahi, playing himself. And what happens is, over the course of a day driving through Tehran, members of the public and just random characters get into his taxi and they each have in their own lives to go on and do different things. One guy just wants to chat about corporal punishment. Another two old ladies want to go and put a goldfish in a fountain for apparently no reason. Uh, You've got another guy who wants to sell some pirate videos and wants dropping off along the way and he's actually a fan... It, it, it's, it's this weird, quirky little ensemble thing. He even picks up his niece for a large chunk of the movie and tells her about the world. As he, and it's all shot through this dash cam and occasionally switches to an iPhone. Uh, well, we don't have a clip because obviously it would be in Farsi. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that would be somewhat lost. We could show you basically anything in Farsi and you'd have to believe it was uh, Taxi Tehran. Um, what I do want to say though, I mean, it, it is politically fueled. Obviously, you can't make this, this particular filmmaker cannot make a film without something that prevalent to his work being brought up. And it is brought up, but it's brought, brought up quite subtly, quite cleverly. Um, his writing and his style and his performances, they are all. I think very much what the film needs in terms of being subtle, being grounded and being interesting and immersive. They, they're non-professional actors. They are anonymous non-professional actors, his, uh, his various passengers. And they each do a terrific job. They really sell their particular characters, for lack of a better term. It is presented as if it's real. It's presented as an actual real documentary. However, obviously, for, you know, it's not real. 
it, it has a sort of narrative hook at the end that kind of tells you it wasn't real. Um, it does go on a little bit when they introduce the character of the niece, who is about 10 or 11 years old, and she does have an enormous propensity for droning on a little bit. And I am aware I've just used drones and Iran in the same sentence, and uh, and that's probably not a good thing. But no, it's uh, probably going to seize every copy of this mm, podcast. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I do like it. I do think it makes its points very interestingly. The politic, the, the political stuff, is very, very subtle and very, very interesting. And uh, I do think it deserves to find an audience. I do think, though, this is a film which, to use one of our favourite terms on this show, is destined for Netflix. <laughs> Um, but it might be better off there or somewhere on like BBC Two, for instance, mm. where it will find the higher brow audience that it deserves. You don't sit this in a multiplex the same week as Spectre, for instance, and expect it to do well. But I liked it very much. I think Panahi's film does the job perfectly, and I'm intrigued to see what he turns out next. I do think it is a ride worth taking, as far as the taxi pun goes, and a fare worth paying, for lack of a better term, Wilson. Mm. <laughs> Exactly. With the latest film news and reviews, this is Off Screen. And we're back. So, you know, before we went away, we were saying Destined for uh, Netflix. And Wilson, I know you were, you were a big fan of saying, So, speaking of Destined to Netflix. <laughs> yeah, speaking of Destined to Netflix, Outcast. <laughs> Outcast, which is the latest, well, I was going to say direct to DVD, but it's not, <laughs> is it, obviously? No, um, it's, it's been like four since then. Yeah, well, the latest, you know, to, well, Once Upon a Time director DVD to star Nicolas Cage. Praise be. Praise be. <laughs> <laughs> Opposite Hayden Christensen. And, yeah, yeah. Mannequin, Mannequin Skywalker, Skywalker. is back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, God. I mean, this. Uh, <sighs> Mannequin Skywalker gets billing ahead of Sir Nick of Cage. He really yeah. does. Ahead of Sir Nick of Cage, the world's greatest living actor, as you like <laughs> yes. to proclaim him. Um, say what you will about Nicolas Cage. His, uh, his output these days is consistently, is consistently sat on that through line between just wow factor and bewilderment it's a test of our faith then it's a test of our faith it really is if you're a true believer you will stomach all these films I know you two worship Nicolas Cage as a god but that that being said God really does work in mysterious ways (laughs) that's all I can say Uh, so this is uh, set shortly after the Crusades in which a grizzled you know haunted by his past crusader who happens to look sort of like an emo played by Hayden Christensen inadvertently becomes the guardian and protector for a usurped heir to an eight to an eastern throne who happens to be i think about a 12 year old boy yeah. uh, hayden christian must escort him to overthrow his brother effectively and guard the royal seal and he must turn to his former mentor played by sir nicholas of cage along the way here's a clip i say clip here's the trailer with some cage yes how'd you find me lad you were his friend we fought alongside one another. You're the outlaw who they call the White Ghost? I am the White Ghost. If we escape my brother, I will be the king. I will give you a reward. How old are you? Ten? Fourteen! Ah! If you save this boy, God will forgive you. Men cannot know God's will when they pretend it ends in blood. That I'll drink to. So, yeah, this is... Uh, you know how Nicholas Cage can occasionally turn out those ones in which uh, he's surprisingly good? Like, uh, what was the... Joe. Remember yeah, yeah, Joe? Yeah. Joe was amazing. Joe was one of his best ones, actually. It yeah. really was. Right, this is not one of those. Is not it not? at all. Shocker. No, this is, this is a $25 million historical tale clearly designed to appeal to the Chinese market above all else. Yeah. That That's what it is. And where the money's gone, I can't quite tell you. I can only imagine that a large chunk of it went to Cage and also paid Hayden Christensen's mortgage for the month. But uh, inter- interestingly enough, did you know that Hayden Christensen is still dating Rachel Bilson? They're married, aren't they? They're married. They have a kid. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know he was even alive. So, yeah, yeah, well, it's doing well so, for yeah, himself. Well, it's a whip, yeah. yeah. See, this this is a, it, it features attempts to make something worthwhile, but it constantly demonstrates a complete lack of anything resembling cohesion. There's nothing about the film that seems to work in tandem with anything else about the film. So you've got James Dormer's screenplay, which he seems to think is all full of pathos and grandeur, and oh, it's it's all this is the new this is. The 
the new Gladiator. No, no, it's not, James. It really isn't. And then you've got Nick Powell's direction, which he seems to think, oh, it's a Ramstein video. It's all four and it's all thrills. But it's not. And then you've got Christensen. And Hayden Christensen's Canadian accent, infused with estuary English, and constantly flopping back from one to the other, is absolutely hilarious. He mm. can't deliver a single line without flipping between one or the other, or settling on an awkward fusion that just comes out as Irish. It's it's bizarre. He, half the time he's Irish, and the rest he's flip flopping between Canadian and estuary. And the less said about Nicolas Cage's performance the better. Boo. I don't even want to get involved in a conversation on what the hell Nicolas Cage is doing in this film but it's just, I mean he's got one of his eyes squinted shut for the entire thing. It's got a scar on it, hasn't it? No, no it hasn't. You're it was, meant to think it does. It was, it was like he's a Blofeld just style just squinting. Scar. Just squinting. Just squinting, that's all. <laughs> that's yeah, but even for questioning him. I am, I am, I am. Let's say, let's say, between, he's got one of Cher's wigs, he's got one eye slammed <laughs> yeah. shut, he's got an accent that has to be heard to be believed. You cannot fathom in any way that the winner of the Best Actor 1995 Academy Award is somehow involved in a project of this lower calibre. I mean, my God, no. I mean, you, you're, you're praying for the bees. You really are. The, the bees, yes, the bees, Nick. The bees. This is absolutely, this is, this is him trolling. He's trolling us. That's what this is. Uh, you'll see, you, I mean, it's got this awful score as well. It's going for this yeah. epic thing, but every now and again it stops to do some lilting oriental music. What the hell? Does it go for <laughs> one? <laughs> To be honest, uh, Nicolas Cage's uh, squinting thing kind of sums up the film better than I can. It just seems that he's done half a job, though, because he shouldn't be squinting with one eye. He should be just slamming both shut. That's what it was. Just slam your eyes shut. Do not witness Outcast. Do, in fact, cast it out. So that's what you do with Outcast. You cast it out. You do not watch it. It does not deserve it. I'm sorry. No, it doesn't. Sorry, Nick. No, we deserve better. Sorry, Wilson. Aww. But I will give you some film news about Nicolas Cage, though. Oh, yeah. Willem <laughs> Dafoe is going to team up with Nicolas Cage. Nice. <laughs> but it is in a film directed by Paul Schrader. Oh, for God's oh, no, sake! Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we mentioned Paul Schrader. For a man who hates his own films. There you go. What, what was it called? About <sighs> which one? The one that he he did the uh... oh yeah. Which did, one? Do you mean the Canyons or, or, or Dying of the Light? Dying of the Light? That's yeah, the Dying of the Light. Light. That's, what, yeah, That's yeah. the one he did with Nicolas Cage. This yeah, is yeah. his second Paul Schrader movie. Which, which I thought... Oh, Canyons was awful as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I thought Dying of the Light was okay, actually. Wilson well, loved the Canyons. <laughs> I didn't. No, you didn't. I really didn't. Nobody loved the Canyons. No. Uh, okay, so can I show one piece of film news then before we move on to the next review? Yeah, sure. uh, we need to start decking the halls. And breaking out the tinsel because Bad Santa Two's happening. Yeah. Bad yeah. Santa Two's happening. I am so excited. And Billy Bob is coming back. Billy Bob is back. Bad Santa Two is freaking happening. Yes, it is going to be a very Merry Christmas in the Connor House next year. Yeah. Uh, well, I should be the year after when I can watch it in the house rather than at the cinema. Mm. But I'm hoping because it starts filming in January. I'm hoping that means it's out for next Christmas. I would think so. so. Yeah. You would imagine, yeah. wouldn't you? Well, you're not going to release Bad Santa Two in July, are you? Oh, the best piece of marketing. I don't know. They did release Mr. Popper's Penguins in August. Yeah, that was, yeah. A, that was strange. <laughs> Let us never forget that. So, what review do we have next? We have uh, Black Souls. Ah, this is the latest by uh, Federico, uh, Federico Munzi, is it? I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Federico Munzi. Uh, this is, we can't play a clip for this one because it's in French and Italian, so you know we could play literally any film. You wouldn't know unless you speak the language. Uh, this is the story of a crime family Um who basically find themselves in an inner conflict over the soul of the young nephew of the family. One of the three brothers' sons is an up-and-comer. He wants a part of the family business. His dad, however, wants to be more of a peaceful farmer, away from the life of crime. But his uncle has other plans for him, and before you know it, the family faces challenges both from within and without. I was going to say here's a clip, but obviously yeah. we wouldn't set that up. Uh, there is no clip. Um, I was like, this is uh, by Frederick Commons. It is a very, very interesting uh, crime drama. It has that brilliant fusion of traditional postcardian Europe. You know, you'll get it on a postcard, but here's some urban crime as well. It does it blends the two quite well, I thought. I mean, it's beautifully shot in places. Um, it comes down to the performances, however, and uh, the performances are top-notch. Uh, the three elder brothers, 
all top notch. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. Marco Leonardi plays the sort of rebellious James Gandolfini esque mm. brother of them, the, the more crying Lordian of them. Uh, you've got Giuseppe Fumo as the young nephew Leo. He's brilliant. He's chosen to play the role without too much sympathy. He's tried not to make it too sympathetic, and the film works on a sort of edgier sense because of that. And uh, I'm trying to remember his name. Federico, uh, sorry, Fabrizio Ferricane, who is absolutely heartbreaking, I, I thought, in this film. Absolutely superb in it. I enjoyed the film very, very much. Um, I don't think it's... I think it's uh, one of those that will find its way to film four very quickly, though. It has a very film four friendly poster, if nothing else. Um, it's uh, kind of it's quite a short film, I would say, about 100 minutes. Paces itself quite well. The only problem with it is it's got like a dividing line down the center where it switches from being from a character driven family drama with some crime crime movie stuff to being a crime drama with some family moments. Other than that very schizophrenic shift down the middle, it is very much worth your time. Definitely check it out. So, some another piece of film news before we move on? Yeah. Go on, man. Yeah. Let's see what else we've got this week. Oh, um, have you heard about the Michelle Rodriguez movie? No. I saw it briefly, yeah. This is called uh, Tomboy, A Revenger's Tale. Great and title. It, yes. <laughs> it's going to be about a hitman who uh, basically go undergoes gender reassignment surgery for a form for a new alias to go out and get revenge, undergoing the transformation to become Michelle Rodriguez. And do you, know, do you know who's performing the surgery? Who? Sigourney Weaver. Excellent. Yeah, I kind of really want to see this yeah. now. I mean, we'll see how sen- how you know sort of sensitively it's it's portrayed. I don't imagine but too I'll sensitively. Say, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining the level of sensitivity of a Luc Besson movie somehow in there. <laughs> hey, I, I'm imagining the Guardian comment section is going to go off the roof of this one. <laughs> quite possibly, quite possibly. So, uh, what's our next review then? Well, this is going to trip me up a bit. Do I sound gay? No, no, Not Wilson, I'll, I'll accuse you of being many things, but never sounding gay, no. There we go. <laughs> Have we all now uttered that sentence? Because we, we can now isolate yeah. that bit of... I'm going to use that. I'm going to take the sound it, clips of each of us asking, do I sound gay? And, yeah, well, at least we've got that incriminating soundbite then to use on each other's partners forever. Wait, can kind of even record it? Do I sound gay? <laughs> well, funnily enough, by doing that, you have inadvertently stumbled upon the plot of this documentary. Uh, this is the documentarian and journalist David Thorpe has decided at the onset of this film that he has a gay voice. I don't mean a gay mindset. I mean an actual verbal voice. His voice sounds gay. That is what he thinks. Uh, he's, he's, he's quite a high-pitched, goes up at the end, effeminate voice, as he puts it. And uh, he decides to investigate... What, is there such a thing as a gay voice? Is it a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Where does the gay voice come from? Can he get rid of his gay voice if he chooses? We have a clip. So, do I sound gay? When you say it like that, you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me rephrase the question. Do Literally, I sound gay? Do you guys think I sound gay? Yes. Yes. I do, but I don't think it sounds as bad as you think it sounds. <laughs> so. Uh-huh. It's interesting um, you choose the word bad. <laughs> it's true. What do you mean bad? No, I don't mean you it like said that. that. Sorry, I don't right. mean it like he that. He said it. He said it. I didn't ask. I didn't... No, he said the word bad. I know. Too. I'm saying you yeah. challenged him. But, I didn't. But I mean, because I, I have the impression that you think it sounds bad. That's why I said right. that. The answer to the film's title is yes. David Thorpe does sound gay. He has a gay voice. <laughs> but much. the film then obviously has to explore why and. Although it does explore the concept of the gay voice, it does explore the existence of the gay voice, it doesn't really explore anything beyond that, and that's kind of a problem. Ultimately, what you are left with in his quest... And he does talk to speech therapists, he talks to psychologists, he talks to noted gay celebrities like George Takai and David Sedaris, and... uh, ultimately the film has no real conclusions to draw whatsoever and my absolute favorite and this kind of sums the film up for you perfectly at one point it is uh, it is put to us that the lisp is a uh, the lisp is a, uh, a prerequisite of a gay voice and one expert says yes there is a connection between lisps and uh, and homosexuality and then the next expert says there is absolutely no link between the lisp and gay men. And you're like, okay, so which is it? And the film never answers. You just go, yeah. yes, it's this. No, it's that. Like, what, what? And that kind of sums the film up for you. At one point he visits, I'm trying to remember his name. 
What's his name? I could not find out afterwards. Um, a, a, uh, a, a dialect coach who apparently is the go-to expert of hiding your gayness in Hollywood. But he's also the go-to how-to-sound gay in Hollywood. And his insight is hampered more by the fact that he just wants to hawk his own CD training courses than anything else. <laughs> Can you contribute anything resembling any kind of qualified opinion to this documentary, or do you really just want us to buy your three-stage course? No. I mean, I will say the thing I took away from it more, because it's very funny, I'll give it that. It's very funny, and it has quite a quirky, again, irreverent tone, much like the way that Fresh Dress did. But you ultimately come down to this one sequence in which it shows you the depiction of Disney characters who are quite clearly meant to be gay. When you see them laid out, you start thinking, actually, I'd never thought of Jafar as being a gay character. But yes, I suppose, ignoring the fact that all he wants is to bone Princess Jasmine, yes, he is a gay character. <laughs> but um, they go through Prince, the history. Prince, uh, Prince Eric from Little Mermaid. I always... Really? Yeah. Oh, no, he's not one one laid out. Really? No. Yeah. They do lay out the characters, and Shere Khan is one of them. Uh, the vil- villain in... It's not a fair about, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the villain in Basil the Great Mouse Detective. I think he's meant to be the first one. Oh, that's then again. It's, yeah, yeah, and then it's Shere Khan. And he takes you through the process. Yeah. Jeremy Irons in uh, Lion King, that's one. Oh, absolutely. That's, yeah. yeah. Uh, they do skip over Frozen. I wonder why. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they do skip over Frozen. But, uh, no, the problem is... You've got this documentary in the end uh, that is presented by Thorpe, who's he's an enjoyable, affable, very likable uh, personality. His speech therapy ultimately amounts to nothing because his so-called straight voice is hilariously inept. <laughs> it just sounds like this. Uh, it, it sounds like someone you know when you hear someone, like uh, you hear someone playing Superman for the first time. Mm. <laughs> I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds wrong. That's kind of what uh, David Thorpe sounds like with his so-called straight voice um the film though is very enjoyable but it's enjoyable and it's funny but it is really inconclusive and it seems terrified of making a point and frankly i kind of expected more of that from a journalist but never mind so uh what have we got are we on to are we on to the biggie next uh, uh, we've just got some more pieces of film news. we've got some more film news and then we're on to the biggie so film news so we got uh, we've got one Oh, Natalie Dormer's going to uh, star in a, in a thriller oh, yeah. that she's written. Mm. That one's interesting. Wolfgang Peterson is going to make his first German movie for 30 years. Yes, he's yeah. going to adapt his own 1970s TV movie. I'm going to, the, the title is Via Gegen die Bank. It is a heist thriller. Hmm. Sort of got that from Gegen. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh, of course, the, uh, the the failure of Pan has apparently killed Joe Wright's Julius Caesar project, Emperor, over at Lionsgate. Good. Serves him right. It does serve you right. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. No. No, Joe. <laughs> no Julius Caesar for you. Oh, uh, after a decade and a half, it is Meow Official. Super Troopers 2 has begun filming. Mm. I don't know about you, but I'm Meow very excited. Uh, Disney are looking for a screenwriter to uh, adapt Tower of Terror for the big screen. Ah, go on, I'll do it. <laughs> well, given that the last <laughs> attempt to make a film out of one of their rides did not end well, I am talking about uh, Tomorrowland, what could possibly go wrong? Although, I got to meet Damon Lindelof for that movie, and he was a damn nice chap. Did you punch him, though, for Prometheus? And Lost, and everything else he's ever done? No, because he was a nice fellow. Go on, just one punch of a ball, that'll do. <laughs> I'm not punching Damon Lindelof in the balls. He's been through enough. He's had to see all of Lost. (laughs) Right, so on to the biggie of the week then. Bond is back. It is time for Spectre, the biggest film in the world this week. So, general gist of the plot this time around. Well, Bond is issued one final mission by the late Judy Dench. I would say the late M, but we we have an M now. So, you know, we have a new M. The old M has bequeathed him one final mission, which seems to be to go and kill a guy and then go to his funeral. Which is very odd, Hmm. I think. But, you know, when Judy Dench leaves you a video message, you tend to do what she asks of you. It's quite polite, isn't it? It's quite polite. Hi, Bond. Uh, Chances are I'm dead. Would you mind going and killing a bloke? But please don't miss his funeral afterwards. Got to pay your respects. Got to pay your respects, after all. Um, And this, of course, leads leads him to a figure from his past whom he believed long dead. And the question becomes, can Bond take down someone that important to him? But that's not the only question on the docket. There is also the question of, 
what's going to happen with MI6? As MI6 and MI5 have merged under the oversight of a new intelligence chief named C, and played by Andrew Scott, uh, who most of us know as Moriarty from Sherlock, who has somewhat more streamlining a plan in mind for the intelligence service, and one that does not involve keeping the double O's around. Here's a clip. Information is all. Is it not? For example, you must know by now that the double O program is officially dead. <laughs> Which leads me to speculate exactly why you came. So, James, why did you come? I came here to kill you. And I thought you came here to die. Well, it's all a matter of perspective. So that's our clip there of uh, Mr. Oberhauser and Mr. Bond. And uh, so, can we, can we just acknowledge at this stage, I think we do all kind of owe Timothy Dalton an apology. Do, I think well, the, yeah. we kind of do. He was always my favourite. Was he your favourite? As a kid, yeah, really? definitely, yeah. I don't know, as a kid I always thought he looked the most like Bond. Yeah, um, but, but yeah, in the sort of direction they were afraid to go with clearly with Timothy Dalton, hence why he was axed after two films. Yeah. yeah. But now, yeah. I do think, though, that the, 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 the Daniel Craig performance has just gotten to the stage where it, it is Timothy Dalton. It is, yeah. It, it's, he, no, you know, Timothy Dalton did Daniel Craig when Daniel Craig was, you know, prepubescent. Was he? Would he have been prepubescent? No, he would have been in his now. 20s. He yeah. would have been in his 20s. Oh, okay, yeah. fair enough. It was 30 years ago. He was already in his 40s. But, uh, <laughs> but Wilson, you and I talked about this uh, by text, actually, during the week, yeah. when we both acknowledged that there is a long history with Bond, uh, whereby they achieve a success and then learn the wrong lessons from it and follow up with something completely awful. Mm. And so you wound up, most recently you had this with uh, Casino Royale, where Casino Royale ticked, ticked the boxes for a lot of people. Not myself, but I respect other people did enjoy it. Mm. And then you had a sequel in which they learned nothing from what had actually worked in Casino Royale. So Quantum of Solace basically took the parts that nobody liked about Casino Royale and then ran with it. Yeah. And GoldenEye obviously led to Tomorrow Never Dies. Um, I don't hate Tomorrow Never Dies as much as most people. But... No, I actually say me. I really like yeah, Tomorrow Never Dies. It's fine for what it is. It's, it's, it's just it's not was... GoldenEye. Yeah. It's just not GoldenEye. Yeah. And GoldenEye for me is the definitive bond. There is a reason Sheldon Hall teaches it in his blockbuster module at Sheffield <laughs> Allen. But uh, so you've got the pattern. You get a good bond film, and then it gets followed up with a bad one. So Wilson, do you think that's happened this time around, or do you think it's not? I don't think it's a bad one. I, I just think it was never, ever going to top Skyfall. I agree and, with that. And I think the best comparison I've seen, particularly online, is this whole Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises. There we are. Yeah. In fact, the yeah. Dark Knight was so good that the Dark Knight Rises couldn't have matched it no matter what it did. And in the case of Spectre, like Dark Knight Rises, it just goes... Uh, completely all out. It throws all the elements in that it can, and a lot of it doesn't work as a result. And if I could be, if you'd streamlined it a bit, I then... do think it needs streamlining yeah. quite a bit because this is the longest Bond film ever, isn't it? It is, yeah, yes. At yeah. 153 minutes, I think. It's technically it's two minutes longer than Sky than Skyfall, which was only really? the longest one. Yeah, I believe oh. it's 154. I think. Oh, right. Well, this is the thing because the film is so laboured. It really is laboured. I mean, it will use three shots where one would have sufficed. And you think, really? Um, there's, there is a sequence of Bond driving into a into a courtyard at one stage, which takes four shots. You're thinking, no, that final shot where you turn around, that's all you needed. You didn't need the three before it. Mm. And, for me, it feels like there is an underwritten film wanting to, wanting to basically burst out. And it's weighed down by just the heft of overplayed and overwrought material. So, for instance, uh, something that sums up the film up for me, and again, case you and I talked about this, mm. Dave Batista's villain, whom I know is named Hinks, and I know this from pre-publicity material, uh, pre yeah. uh, materials, he's not named in the film. He's not. No. Uh, he has one line of dialogue in the film, he has no character whatsoever, and he literally shows up when the plot calls for an action sequence. I mean, at one stage, I think, hang on, you'd have had to have been sat back there for six hours doing nothing in order to do this. And this is my problem with... Uh, with I'm going to call it Skyfall, and I keep going to call it Skyfall, with Spectre. 
It is a film that very much wants to be gritty and real, but only when it suits it. And it becomes an issue with things like, okay, so if you want to pop out and attack them at the last minute, that means you have to have been sat there for six hours doing nothing. And the problem is that then becomes quite goofy and silly. And you can get away with that when it's the Pierce Brosnan traditional Bond. You know, the slightly goofy Bond, but not when it's the gritty real Bond. But you can get away with that when it's the, like, live and let die, Roger Moore kind of... The goofy and of course, Bond. With, with it, so, somebody like Jaws, I think there are, Pinks I think, is definitely yeah. based on. I think there's an attempt to bring yeah. too much goofiness into Daniel Craig. There is, yeah. yeah. There is. There's, there's quite a few there are moments spots. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Where well, you just think, oh, I don't think you've thought through... You want this to be gritty and real, but you're trying to... You're basically, you are trying to have your cake and eat it. Yeah. You're trying to have too much traditional bonding. I know there was a thought at one stage they wanted to go back to flamboyance with this one, and mm. apparently they just couldn't bring themselves to do it effectively. The problem is they seem to have still gone and tried, and it doesn't work. And what you've got is a film that's quite awkward in places, like that. There's that bit on the train car. He pops out. You mm. have to have been there for half a day, because Bond has... Bond has been sat in a train car for six hours with this girl, and you, what did you hop on at the last stop? What have you been sat there reading a book? It somehow manages to sum up my entire opinion of it. The, having said that, the opening sequence, yeah, yeah, You're fantastic. Amazing. Yeah, now you, you love a good long shot, don't you? I do. Yes. Yeah, the yeah. Goodfellas shot. We all love the Goodfellas shot. Bond as Birdman. Basically. Bond as Birdman. Yeah. Bond, yeah. <laughs> Bond man. Bond, Bond man. man. <laughs> <laughs> someone, just yeah, someone needs to edit this with the the Birdman score. Yeah. yeah. Someone really does. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Someone needs the jazzy Birdman score. Yeah. yeah. And that opening it was, scene it was great. Though, yeah. The action stuff doesn't particularly interest me as much as that long shot does. That long shot that. Mm took my breath away yeah, well, the helicopter action sequence that followed it was yeah cool you know helicopter action yeah. sequence but i was more impressed by the long shot mm. which was really so yeah. well executed i do feel like sam mendez had the weight of the world put upon him by following up skyfall i think under the circumstances he's done a fine job mm. but it is just fine for me i don't think it's outstanding it's not as impressive as skyfall was i think it's a bit like joss whedon it is, yeah, it, is. Yeah. it is very yeah. much the Joss Whedon Avengers scenario. Absolutely. I think him being one of the few directors to follow up his Bond film was probably a bad idea because historically it's never really wound up well. I'm thinking, is Guy Hamilton the only one who's ever... Yeah, oh. he, he directed, I don't want to say Far Five, but in the mm. early days with Sean Connery. But that Which... was fine back then in the sort of... Uh, what's the lack of term I'm going to uh, on to these Ealing kind of days? Yeah, well, that's still like under an old studio system, mm. really. Under the old know, studio it... stuff's fine, but not now. And I just want to put it out there. If you put down the lyrics to Writings on the Wall, Ugh. and you put them on a piece of paper, and you put it next to a murder victim, you would actually get away with murder, because I'm pretty sure anyone who investigated would interpret that as a suicide note. Yeah. Of but, course, because uh, Sam Smith wrote it. Yeah, uh, uh, on the subject of that song, incidentally, can we all just address the fact that we have a, a, a Bond credit sequence that looks like hentai? Yeah. It mm. is too is big... It is. Yeah. We are two yeah. big-eyed schoolgirls away from hentai <laughs> with that opening sequence. Just a bit. So, out of ten, then, if you're going to give Spectre a rating, I, actually, what would you give Skyfall out of ten? Well, this is a controversial one because it's like nine or ten for me. Because for okay. me, for yeah, me, Skyfall yeah. is one of the best Bond films. That yeah, that's it, a common. It, thought, it's common up there with From Russia with Love and Goldeneye. So that's Skyfall goes. It's quite funny because you know I made a list a couple of years ago, of, like ranking all my Bond you did. films. Yeah, and it wasn't in like the top eight when when go back comparing it. Is that it's a solid like seven out of ten film. I really enjoyed it, but it does try and do too much in the end, and I think that's the problem. You think Sky that's Skyfall? No. Spectre. Spectre. No. Okay. I transitioned that way. Yeah. Well, yeah, you did. <laughs> <clears throat> um, what do you give Spectre out of ten, then, guys? Well, I would give Skyfall an eight, I would give Spectre a six. Do you know what? I would go with that. Actually, yeah. I, I, I would go with Cases of Pain on that. I think what, one of the things that really ruined it for me, and I don't want to give any spoilers away, there is the, M, the MI6, MI5... Uh, C storyline in the film and I think that by going in the direction that it does in the third act it feels cheap and it feels easy and you think oh come on we did the bureaucracy thing was so good in Skyfall the the, the bureaucracy aspect the, bu the bureaucracy is evil aspect of Skyfall yeah. was so well done 
Why couldn't that have been the case here? That would have been brave, I, I think. I mean, I'll say, when I say it does too much, I think the whole sea thing is too much. You think that's... They, they've yeah. already done all that in Skyfall. And I think the problem with Bond says has at the moment is that it can't reconcile how it's, you know, 2015 now. And there's all this technology that makes 007 and all that lot actually irrelevant. And I need that I, as a plot. And, that's a plot yeah. in itself. That's a Bond movie in itself. I, and they need to get to a point where it's... Uh, where either 007 is universe becomes timeless, so we don't have to address this stuff anymore, or we need mm. to find a way to work around it, because I'm sort of a bit bored of the office politics bit now. Yeah, I think we have reached a point where it's just becoming an episode of Spooks over and over. Skyfall ran that risk quite a bit, where it looked like it, we're in Spooks territory now. Yeah, but this, they were, this is all that definitely did it, especially for me, like the last 25 minutes definitely felt like... An mm. overlong episode of Spooks. I do. I mean, I, I'm I'm kind of disheartened by the fact that you know the the Skyfall sequel got outdone in 2015 by Spooks: The Greater Good, mm. and that's it for me because Spooks: The Greater Good was a better Daniel Craig Bond movie <laughs> than Daniel Craig's Bond sequel. But uh, oh well, you can't win them all. So. Will he come back? Uh, I kind of hope not because this does round out his story quite well. I think. Did you find that mm. as awesome? It does. I, I, it rounds out the crowd. I, 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 I yeah. can't really mention it without spoiling it, but it does feel like the end a lot more than what Skyfall did. Yeah, I do. I think that as well. Oh, and just just to put anyone's mind at ease, this does begin with the gun barrel opening. So you will finally get the gun barrel opening again. I actually like the music they played uh, over the distributor logo at the beginning. Yeah, as well. so I thought that was really, really moody and effective. So uh, we should plug our competitions for this week. Mm. Um, new one this week. If you go to onscreenfilm.com uh, in our competition section, you can enter enter and win goodies. Uh, we've got Kill Your Friends goodies, uh, uh, which is mm. the soundtrack, the book by John Niven, the original book, and a signed poster by I will, Nicholas I will Holt. say... That book mm. is my favourite book. Really? Yeah. Are you looking forward to the film then? No. <laughs> <laughs> because the person that was meant to be playing the lead character... Who was it meant to be? It was meant to be uh, Tim Spall's son. Rafe Spall? It was meant to be Rafe Spall. Oh, actually, and, I can kind of see it now. Yeah, yeah. That, that character. And then he dropped out because of scheduling or whatever. Mm. And then Nick Holt came in and I was like, oh, no thanks. I'm, oh. still, I'm still not convinced by Nick Holt as a concept. You're not? No. By Nick Holt as a concept. I don't, yes. I don't mind him inside. I don't mind him as Beast. I think he works no. perfectly well. Did you find him shining chrome? <laughs> oh, yeah. Shining <laughs> chrome is great. He's great as Nook, but... Yeah. So, um, we need to pick a film of the week. And to be honest, it's a, it's, I'm going to go controversial. I'm going to say it's a toss up between Taxi Tehran and Black Souls. Neither of which we can play clips for because we're, neither of them were in English. Uh, so, we need to look at next week as well uh, when we're going to have He Named Me Malala. That that's looks really that's good. very interesting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, this is the story. Do you, you know the story? So I'm, not, I'm not totally up on the story. What is it? It's She's a young Iranian girl, isn't she? Yeah. Uh, I'm not <laughs> totally up on it as well. I was hey, forced I'm, to watch the trailer yesterday. Yeah, hey, I, I, I think it's to do with the fact that you know she's a female in a in a country that represses females, yeah. and that, you know she speaks something as a result makes Didn't a lot she of win, like, political enemies. Prize, or she won the Nobel Prize. I want to say that she did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've also <laughs> a movie with far less gravitas: Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse. <laughs> we got that next week. No Nobel Peace Prizes. No won. Nobel Peace Prizes were issued in the making of Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse. <laughs> we also have Kill Your Friends, as we've mentioned, yeah. with Nick Holt, uh, Bradley Cooper. That great movie star is back in Burnt, in which he plays a chef with everything to lose. Hey, I've seen that film called Chef. Yeah. Uh, we also have Brooklyn, which stars Saoirse Ronan and Donald Gleeson, so it's probably going to be amazing. And Nicolas Cage is back in The Runner. Yes! This has been a uh, Candy Store production for On Screen. I've been Van Connor. My name is Case Allen. I'm Chris Olson. And we'll be back next week. Just show me the way to get out of here and I'll be on my way. You've been listening to Offscreen. For more news and reviews, visit onscreenfilm.com.